Not only publishing, publishing in newspaper, organizing events, and proposing policy to reduce the risk of human extinction by AI. So, also from Holland, Netherlands. Yeah, too many. Okay, no, 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 no. How's to lift? Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Indeed, uh, my name is Otto Bata. I'm the founder and director of the Existential Risk Observatory. And this is a non-profit uh, located in Amsterdam, aiming to reduce existential risk by informing the public debate. Um, so, a little bit about my background as an introduction. I'm a physicist and a sustainable energy engineer. Um, I worked as a, in wind energy for some time. Um, and I founded a startup in smart charging e-vehicles until I got really excited about it. And also uh, was active as a climate activist, uh, among others for Extinction Rebellion, uh, as you see here on the right. So before um, uh, gaining an interest in existential risk, and it happens mostly uh, through a lecture by Anders Sandberg, uh, moderated by David Wood. Uh, thanks a lot for, for that, David. And uh, thanks for inviting me here, of course. Um, and then I, I moved on after a few years to found the Existential Risk Observatory. So my, my uh, personal trajectory was a bit like you see on the right of this slide. Uh, on the top you see an article in the newspaper, The Telegraaf. Um, me being arrested by a policeman as a climate activist. Uh, heading, headed with the, the title, uh, Klimaatdemonstranten krijgen betaald, or Climate Protesters Get Paid, which wasn't true. Um, and the second is an article in the same newspaper. Uh, one smarter as a uh, human AI cannot be contained, and that's also me in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So, at the Existential Risk Observatory, we uh, aim to reduce AI existential risk mostly. On the right, you see kind of a starting point of uh, how we look at existential risk, uh, which is the uh, quantitative estimate by Toby Ord from the author of The Precipice. Um, so, According, so there, there's quite a bit of discussion about these quantitative estimates and whether you should do this or not. Uh, they can be all over the place. However, I think there's a couple of robust conclusions that you can draw from them. For example, existential risk is much higher than it has ever been. And existential risk, for those who don't know, um, is uh, containing human extinction risk, but also a permanent dystopia um, or a societal collapse. So in any case, something uh, that makes sure that we do not really have a, a great future anymore, which we could otherwise potentially have by developing lots of technology. Now, personally, I'm not necessarily in favor of developing lots of technology or having a, a great future in that sense. I'm not a, a futurist and, um, or not, not really a transhumanist either. Um, but I do think we should be able to reach agreement on the, uh, that, that we should not go extinct, for example. Um, so, while these estimates are uncertain, I think existential risk is definitely much higher than it has ever been. Um, it's also mostly because of technology that we develop, so we could principally do something about it. And AI is playing a very important role. So we focus on reducing AI existential risk by raising awareness. So, I think a lot of you are already familiar with AI existential risk, maybe quite uh, intimately already. Um, but we think very high over, this is, um, th th there might be two basic options and there are many um, links between the two, but um, you could say, okay, we, we could solve this, this, this uh, problem that AI could cause human extinction by aligning it. So of course, there's not the AI that we have right now, that's it's only narrow still, um, but although you could discuss whether GPT-4 is very narrow, but uh, um, it's not about the AI that we have right now, but it's about artificial general intelligence, which could do anything at a human level. Um, and then mostly artificial superintelligence, which might follow either short, uh, shortly after or, or, or a bit longer after, um, which could um, yeah, um, cause human extinction by scenarios such as an AI takeover um, in, in different ways, multipolar takeover, takeover unipolar takeover. Um, or maybe bad actor risk, just someone pressing, uh, okay, let's, let's exterminate humanity. Um, so, but principally, you could um, reduce this risk by, by aligning AI. That has been the main um, proposal or the, the, the main solution direction um, of the last decades, I think. So this means making sure that AI is doing, uh, doesn't really matter how powerful it gets, doesn't really matter if it has takeover capability, but make sure that it does exactly what we want. 
So AI safety scientists have tried this method and are still trying pretty hard and that's great, I think. Uh, but so far they haven't really seen the breakthroughs that many wished for. Um, and there are also theoretical reasons, and this is linking to uh, a paper, I think, by uh, Romy Apolsky, uh, which I co-authored a Time article with, that there are theoretical reasons why the control problem might not be solvable in principle. Um, so if this happens, then yeah, AI alignment uh, is not really going to, to save us. So we might need something else as well. And of course, uh, this, this is um, uh, kind of a niche opinion, I guess, in the alignment field that it's not solvable in principle. Uh, but many people think it might be solvable, but not in time. Uh, so that's another reason why we would need regulation. Um, regulation, so, and, and of course there are also many kinds of regulation which still uh, depends on AI alignment, and there are many kinds of crossovers between the two. Uh, but regulation until safety is proven is one other uh, potential option to, to reduce AI existential risk. So we think there are many types of regulation. We think hardware regulation looks, looks relatively promising at this point. And we think that effective, lasting regulation, however it looks, will require widespread awareness of the problem. So that's the, the main reason. Uh, there are other reasons, but why we raise AI existential risk awareness aiming for effective regulation. Um, so raising awareness, it should help in two ways. So uh, regulation is one way, but the other one is even if you develop uh, AI safety technically, we still think it helps if this problem is mainstreaming because it should increase the talents working on this problem, the funding, the number of institutes. For example, AI safety organizations, I created this slide about one year ago and then it was still something uh, hypothetical pretty much. But right now you can see that indeed the debates about AI safety has led to founding AI safety organizations in the UK, the US and Japan. So I think this trend should, should continue and it's quite constructive. Um, it should also lead to more diversity, not a, a niche group of people, but, uh, but many uh, different types of people uh, trying to develop solutions to this problem and increase priority. So what we are doing is raising awareness at scale using traditional media. So we published about 35 articles and interviews and other media items in Dutch and in international media about AI existential risk. Among those, twice in Time magazine, and we have a total reach of uh, about a few million. And we also organize events. So we organized four larger events on the existential risk, uh, where we couple experts to politicians, journalists and others. So what we aim to do is invite experts such as Stuart Russell, um, Max Tegmark that you see here on the picture, Jan Tallinn I think can also be, be called an expert on this topic. Um, and connect them to uh, journalists and, and others who could help in solving the problem. Politicians. Um, here on, on this picture, on the second from the left, you see the Dutch Director General of uh, the Ministry of um, Domestic Affairs, Robert Rosendel. So he's one of the persons that, that could def uh, develop uh, policy in the Netherlands. So if we yeah, uh, get him to talk to someone like Max Tegmark, also on this picture, I hope that constructive policy uh, discussions take place. So our debates so far led to policy meetings with MPs and articles in leading newspapers and about 18,000 online views. Um, and we also use our presence in the public debate to lobby government. So for example, on the right you see uh, a motion that has passed uh, Dutch Parliament um, asking for more AI safety research. It was interesting, I, I thought that once this motion got accepted that this uh, research would happen, but it, apparently it doesn't really work like this. Uh, the motion got accepted, but nothing really happened. Um, so what's apparently necessary is a sustained uh, pressure coming from both the lobbying and also from the societal debate. Uh, I think journalists are important here. Uh, we also had a meeting with an EU chief of staff, and it may or may not have contributed to the commission endorsing AI existential risk. Uh, it's something nice to claim in any case. So. We are also doing some research, and our research um, is showing that, that newspaper articles do change people's minds. When we were doing this for about a year, and we had our first uh, couple of articles published, we were of course wondering if this is really helpful. Um, so we measured the effectiveness of, uh, um, of these articles. What we're basically asking people is, um, for the next 100 years, imagine human extinction, and then imagine the top three causes that might, uh, uh, might lead there. Um, so we try very hard not to prompt people to say something AI related or to prompt them in any other way to say something AI existential risk positive. 
Um, and then, um, normally, most people do not put AI in these top three, but say something like a pandemic, climate change, or uh, something else, meteorite strike, all kinds of original answers. We had seconds coming once, it was also an interesting one. Um, but, but usually not AI, but then we uh, do our uh, intervention, make sure that people read our article and uh, check a second time whether AI is included or whether it has risen in the top three. And we count either of those as a conversion. And so we get a conversion of about in between 30 and 50% uh, from a media item, which is not, not too bad, I think. Um, it's also interesting that we, we get the base rates for free with this uh, measurement. So uh, um, when we ask people for the first top three, some people do actually include AI or something similar already in their top three. And you see the results of that in the graph on the right. Um, in our first measurement, and it's 300, so don't read too much into it, but I think it's, uh, it was all right. Um, we got about 7% awareness already of AI existential risk in the main audience without prompting people. That has risen to 12% five months later, um, so quite a lot happened then. This was the time when uh, GPT-4 came out, ChatGPT, etc. Um, open letter as well. So um, this, this is probably rising, but it's still not very high. Uh, some other surveys get very different numbers. In fact, some surveys get 50 or 60% or something. Uh, so this, this is heavily depending on, on the type of prompting that you, that you do in the, in the survey. Um, but this, this kind of corresponds to my gut feeling when you're talking to people, how many people are actually concerned about AI existential risk. Uh, some, but not many. Um, but it is rising, and I think this is one of the, the type of ideas that, that could have a tipping point. So I can imagine that uh, once AI gets better, um, this, this is the fundamental thing that I don't really get about AI existential is that it very much depends on, on the speed of AI development. So many people are not really worrying about this until AI gets really good, then they start to worry. Um, I think it should be the other way around. I think we should decide already at this point that when AI gets really good, we should uh, have a defense already about AI existential risk, uh, making sure that we have ways to, to make sure that it, this does not happen. Um, but in practice, it follows the technological development. Um, so I think it's, it's quite likely that it, it depends quite a bit in the future, I think, on how fast AI will, will develop, uh, whether it's hitting some kind of a plateau, I can imagine, um, or whether large language models are really a significant part of AGI. In that case, I would expect uh, awareness to rise fast as well. But it's a bit of a sidetrack. Um, I think the, the point of this slide is, I, I think, this could well be the kind of idea that has a tipping point. So at some point, um, let's say 15 or 20% of, of uh, people uh, see AI as an existential risk. They tell other people, etc., and then it's, uh, uh, it uh, increases quite, uh, quite fast to maybe 90% or something. And this happens in other things. Uh, I think it's, it's not unlikely that it will happen in uh, existential risk as well. Um, so, yeah, this is actually one of the things that we're currently working on is getting a new data point. I'm really curious where, where this is right now. Um, so, this is a bit of a, uh, one of the things that we, we want to do in uh, 2024. So, we want to publish more articles, of course. Um, eight more high profile is the, the goal for this year. Organize two large events and five smaller ones. Five smaller ones mainly in the Netherlands, two larger ones internationally, wherever it's most impactful. In any case, before the next AI Safety Summit, which will be online slash Korea and uh, the one after that in France. Um, we will continue to lobby, lobby the Dutch government uh, regularly, uh, email them policy proposals and other things that we think might be helpful. Um, and we will continue our research. I uh, highlighted this a little bit for this audience because I think it might be interesting for people that already know something about AI existential risk. So for example, AI existential risk threat models. Um, so before, we, we haven't really done that much research because mostly we were about, okay, we, we, we do know that AI is an existential risk, the research is already there, and it's basically, the, according to our theory of change, the message that we think should be in the societal debate. Um, so we're, we're just transferring existing knowledge from research to the societal debate. Um, however, there are still some really interesting open questions and we, we can't really not, re <laughs> not research them somehow. Um, so one of these is the AI uh, existential threat models. Um, first, I, I was expecting that, okay, those who think that AI could cause human extinction 
probably all have a similar threat model, the, the way in which this could happen. But nothing is further from the truth. There are quite a bit of threat models and they're all very different. Um, so I'm wondering how likely it is that all are realistic. I think that it's probably some are more realistic than others. Um, and we would like to say something, um, yeah, say something about it. Um, hopefully, we will, we can elevate the discussion at some point to a situation where it's not just uh, also in the public debate AI is an existential risk, but where people are also saying, well, we're afraid of a multipolar takeover, for example, and it would uh, work like this. Uh, then we can develop much more directed policy uh, to uh, targeting this specific threat model. Um, so this, this part of the research also, uh, so the tipping point that I already discussed, are we close to it, uh, how to reach it, if we want to, how to navigate it in general, what type of uh, action should we take. Um, also, I think implementing a pause, that's one of the, the very fascinating things that this is called for, and it is, uh, we're also supporting the, the AI pause, um, and there's definitely a group supporting this, um, but it, there's not really a proposal of how to do this uh, beyond a few years. I think the first few years is relatively straightforward. There's just a few big companies developing AI. So assuming that, that AGI would indeed originate from one of those, uh, basically you can just walk into those companies given, given political will, of course, and say, okay, uh, we're going to pause. Um, but beyond a few years, it's not just those companies doing it anymore, but, uh, but yeah, uh, it could be that because of algorithmic improvements, hardware improvements, at some point, pretty much anyone could, could create AGI. Um, so what kind of policy is actually um, going to, to uh, reach a pause for a longer period? Does it exist even? If it doesn't exist, then we should know. If it does exist, we should also know, and we should know what it looks like. Um, so I think this, uh, yeah, and th these are hard questions. So I'm, I don't know, probably we, we cannot find definite answers, but maybe we can do something useful uh, towards uh, having an answer. Oops, sorry. Um, Something else that's fascinating is, is there a specific Dutch policy given ASML's unique position? Of course, we have the, the major company ASML, which is very important in the, the global supply chain towards uh, AI. Um, and perhaps there's something unique that we can do in the Netherlands to reduce existential risk. Um, and the last one is uh, EVALS, so AI evaluations are, are an often mentioned uh, policy proposal. So basically, um, you're training AI, you're developing AI, and these, these are tests to make sure that how far is it already and how misaligned is it, how capable it is it and how misaligned is it. Um, we're really curious when those, e uh, we're really um, curious when those evals will, will actually go off. At, at some point, presumably, if you make such an eval, it's actually going to turn red, and uh, indeed, it, it, the AI is very powerful or very misaligned or both. Uh, so can we look ahead a little bit and say, okay, um, we, we say in three years this eval using current scaling laws what might go off uh, and what should we actually do at this point? So um, I would like to uh, highlight a nice, uh, a nice cooperative environment that there is in existential risk field. So we're working together with uh, Dutch universities and also with a bunch of international institutions especially Conjecture, for example, was uh, a UK AI safety company, was uh, co-organizing the, the previous event that we organized before the uh, AI safety summit. Um, and, well, we're just happy to be cooperating with those institutes. A few words about our team. Um, we have a board consisting of me, uh, Joop, who's an entrepreneur, and Marco, who's working as a publishing agency and a team uh, with uh, Ruben Dieleman, our permanent campaign manager, Mirti Hulkens, who is our media strategist and ex-MP and ex-journalist, Mike Postima, who's working on public relations, and Irish Mann, who's uh, helping us with research. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll have some time for questions, I think.